Level checks were good? Level checks were good. Okay. Hey, listen to Commander Cookout Podcast, episode 78. I'm Brando. I'm here with Ryan, and today we're going to spend some time setting up our new arc and talk about what competitive means in your meta. Now hit our theme song! Hey, Ryan. We're back for another whirlwind adventure. How you doing? Good. What's going down? A whole ton is going down. We're going to set up our new arc, our new giveaway, and we're going to spend some time kind of pulling back the curtain. We're going to talk deck building. We're going to talk deck building philosophy, and we're going to talk more about building decks and strategies that fit into your meta and what that means on kind of different axioms of play. Did I use that word right? I definitely did. Uh, I've never heard that word before, but you... Uh, I've never heard that word before, but you are the English major, so eh. I'm sure it was right. If I was wrong, F me, I guess. You know what? That sounds like a 7 o'clock p.m. word. (laughs) Because we're recording at night instead of in the morning. Yeah. Yeah, we had a... Got some uh, life stuff that's happening on the weekend, and I usually record with you. And so we're recording a little bit early in the week, later in the day. Uh, good life stuff, bad life stuff. You broke your elbow. Is it something to do with that? No, I, I cracked my elbow wrestling. I am an aspiring pro wrestler. Broke my elbow with some dude's head. Go me. And um, yeah, I'm going to a wedding. With the dude? No, different guy. A cousin of mine. Haven't seen him in 15-ish years, but he wanted to do one of those big family weddings. Ugh. Yeah, weird thing about it, no dance, like no party afterwards. It's just the wedding ceremony and then the speeches and food. Open bar, though. Ooh. Yeah, so we're driving out to Calgary on Friday, and we're going to get drunk on Saturday, hang over Sunday, home on Monday. Huh. You know how I know that you're not from Calgary? Because you called it Calgary. Calgary. Saskatoon. Saskatchewan. Yeah. I said all of those wrong, but that is how I say most of those words. Interesting. Speaking of Saskatchewan, I cut my grass today, first time in months, because it's never <laughs> rained. <laughs> yeah. It didn't rain all summer, and then as soon as September got here, it's rained for like two weeks. It's rained like since the beginning of September. Now it's like September 19th. Yeah, today's the first sunshiny day in uh, weeks. Yeah, I think so. And it's still cold. Yeah. Well, it's uh, September, right? It's going to be like snow tomorrow. Yeah. Damn it. Actually, Welcome to Canada. They're calling for it on Friday, actually, but... It's terrible. Who's counting? <laughs> yeah. Fuck. <laughs> <laughs> no list today. No list today. But a whole bunch of commander-related theory, theology episode. Ooh. Did I use that? I think I made that word up. If you make it up, you used it right. Those are the rules. <laughs> okay. Um... That's going to happen a whole bunch more now. I hope you know this. Absolutely. I'm down for it. Social media coordinates? Social media coordinates. We are CCO Podcast on Twitter and tappedout.net. That's where you could see any of the lists that we talk about over the course of the show. No lists today, but we'll be back on that tomorrow with our new arc. We're commandercookout at gmail.com. That's where you can send us show suggestions, love mail, hate mail, suggestions for new arcs. Once you <gasps> learn about the next arc. Wait. Oh. I thought you were going to say suggestions for... N- Nudes? <laughs> no nudes, Ryan. No. <laughs> Anyways. <laughs> We're also Commander Cookout on iTunes, Google Play, Google Machine, YouTube, Facebook, Patreon, EDHREC.com, Flipside Gamer, where you can use CCO Podcast special promo code, CCOFU, to get 10% off your order store-wide, and the official, official home of Commander Cookout Podcast on the whole internet, CommanderCookout.com. Not bad. Thanks. Not bad. Working hard on it. So we've got the promo code with FlipsideGaming.com. Right. CCOFU. 10% off your whole order. We have branched out and we have a giveaway with another, I'm going to call them retail website. That's fun. MTGOnslaught.com. Hooray. Yeah. Ian at MTGOnslaught.com. Go there. I think that's how I'm going to say it. You know, we we have a special way to say every website? Sure. MTGOnslaught.com. I like that. <laughs> it's not very clear, but I'm sure everybody will get it. Link will be in the show notes. They make, uh, let's call them gaming accessories, right? Dice, 
counters like plus one, minus one, poison counters, um, and I don't know, metal spin down life counters, but they're not spin like not spin down dice. They like tick down. Like they're two dials that have a twenty uh, like one to twenty on one side and twenty one to forty on the other. And there's one for each color, like a demon, an angel, a dragon, for all the different colors. Cool. Ian at mtgonsot.com has been generous enough to send me and you a little bit of a sample, and we like them enough that we want to give a bunch to CCO Nation. That's you guys. Yes. Yeah. It's also us, but we already have some. Yeah, we already have some. So we're going to share the wealth with everybody out there. So we're working with Ian right now, and we are going to set up a prize package. And it could contain anything from dice, counters, spin down. He's got his own line of apparel. So it could mean t-shirts. It could also mean KMC Perfect Fit sleeves. Could mean a whole bunch of different things. And over the next month, I think all of October is going to be our new arc, right? Yep. From the first Tuesday till the last Tuesday, including some sort of bonus content. Yeah, we talked about that on our last show. Yes, so go listen if you haven't. <laughs> we could go over it all again later on in this episode. If we remember, we'll try and do that. I'm purposely going to forget. I will probably just actually forget. Be on the lookout for all of the details for the latest giveaway on our Facebook and on CommanderCookout.com. The official, official home of Commander Cookout Podcast. Yeah, very it's, much so. It's cool that we have our own website. I'm just really excited about that. <laughs> we are big time now, if you will. I will. Moving on. No shout outs this week, but we do have uh, a tip of the hat to some of our longer time patrons and members of our own personal play group that have conversed via email. But still, we were all there, and we've kind of decided on the direction that we're going to take the show for the next month. Okay, do tell. So, we've had a whole bunch of success. Let's see if you can get the trend here, okay? We've had a whole bunch of success with episode 48, our Edgar Markov list. That was a good one. Okay. Yep. Tuned him up for our man, JJ. Very much so. Episode 73, Prosh where we built like a funky prosh list instead of like the super competitive prosh list. Yeah, we did that in uh, this last arc here. Yes, very much so. And also Yidris Eldrazi Tribal. That we, was episode 62. That's when we tuned down our our own tier one CEDH deck. Yeah, and that was like episode, uh, I want to say like 29 or something. It was back last December when we had F.U. Joel. He we sat did, right there. Yeah, we did it. sat right there. Tier one Yidris list, combo list with um, like... Doomsday. Yes, Doomsday. And then months later, we did um, Eldrazi Tribal. Much more fun, much more well-received. So much so that we have decided to make an arc out of the whole thing. Yes, we have. We are going to take competitive EDH decks and we are going to tune them down to make them fun. They'll still do the same kind of stuff, but they're sort gonna, of in a way that allows them to be played a little bit more casually. So you're not going to sit down with your Yidris and go, turn two, I combo out and kill you. There won't be any of that. There's going to be a lot more just kind of sitting down. You're still playing. It's still going to be an interesting deck. It's going to be a complex deck like the tier one decks tend to be, but it won't be a tier one wrecking machine and hopefully won't cost you $3,000. Oh, yeah, that. So what are we going to call it? I like, suggested by a few of our patrons and playgroup members, Tier 1 Tune Downs. Tier 1 Tune Downs from Toontown, because we live in Saskatoon. Yes, it's called Toontown, yes. Yeah. For anybody who doesn't know. I like that. Tier 1 Tune Downs from Toontown. Tune in to... Tune down. I'm not a radio guy. I don't yeah, know. I don't know where we'd go with that one. I, just, I need some more time to think about it. You sprung that one on me. Sprung oh. it on me. Okay, well, you've got a week, and we're going to come at you, not you, CCO Nation, yeah. with a list. And I'm actually super excited about taking a bunch of the really the best stuff that like Commander has to offer and just tossing it in the garbage and being like, yeah. hey, this is way 
funner. This is way more fun to do. You guys are doing it wrong. Pay attention to us. We're going to do it better. Yeah. So if you're into that, if anybody's into that, I guess shoot us some some sweet lists, some spicy lists, some some oddball lists, right? Like that Eldrazi tribal Yidris list that we were talking about. Um, I think it was actually you that said you really liked the list, right? I did. I did like it. And uh, I don't know, it was just a lot more fun than doing regular combo stuff. No, that's not what we're going to do for the whole arc. We're not going to take like Yidris Doomsday combo and turn it into Yidris Eldrazi. We're going to take something. We, I, we haven't really decided which decks we're going to do yet, but we're going to pick somebody. Let's just say Prosh. And instead of it just being Food Chain Prosh, it will be a step down from Food Chain Prosh. Yeah. <laughs> this is part of what we're going to get into today. Um, is competitive synonymous with not fun? And is not competitive synonymous with bad? I don't think so. I also don't think so. Right? And what does competitive actually really mean? What does it refer to in any given situation? I think that's what we wanted to tackle this week. And it's, this is just something that popped into my head, so I'll just say it because that's it's our show. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I make the rules here. Exactly. Um, I think that secretly, really deep down, even the really casual EDH people, like I consider myself to be, I consider myself a casual player, I think deep down, somewhere in the deep recesses of our magic playing sensibilities, we all really kind of want to play one of those big time wrecking machine decks where you really kind of, you want that high power level and you want that game breaking effect kind of thing to to happen for you. But we stop, we temper ourselves before we get in there, like how humans have been taught to feel pain so they can't lift cars and blow all their joints out. You know all about that. Which and part? The, well, how the human body feels pain to stop it from destroying itself. That's a real thing. I don't feel pain. <laughs> I lift cars. I rolled a quad off my cousin one time that tipped over on him. Wow. And it like the handlebars tipped over directly onto the side of his helmet. And it cracked his helmet all the way from the side to the back. Always wear a helmet. Yeah, he'd have been dead. Mm-hmm. There it is. Yeah, very much so. Yeah, so what we're going to do is take that, you're going too far, you're off in the woods, you're way out there in the power, and we're going to just kind of dial that back so you still get that high-powered experience, but you're not a big piece of shit that nobody wants to play with. <laughs> yeah, you know what's funny is secretly deep down we all have that urge to go onto any commander Facebook group that we follow and use that fancy text all in big white letters that says, Pictures only. I need every good counter spell because I'm... Turn two combos only. Pictures, please. Yeah. Yeah. You know what I find funny about those pictures, please posts? Oh, I hate them. Because it just proves that the guy, A, is super lazy and can't look on the internet to, like, find out what the cards do. And, B, that they don't know what any of the cards do. Mm -hmm. If I walk up to you and I say, hey, man, Flash Hulk, and you don't know what I'm talking about, you need to just... Play magic a little bit more until you know that. Then I'll give you the two-card turn two combo. Yeah. We looked at some Flash Hulk lists right before the show. That's why it popped into my <laughs> <Yeah>. head. <laughs> speaking of Flash Hulk, speaking of tuning backwards, or tuning in general, I guess, you and I have both been pretty busy tuning over the last, I would say the last arc that we just did. Yes. Over the last arc of Who Wore It Better, You've been tuning your green, black stacks list, and I've been tuning my Zada and my Karlov list, and I built Vivictus as Mahdi, and we both built a deck for Jesse. What the you, Jesse. What the hell is wrong with us? So what we wanted to get into today, in addition to what is actually competitive, what does that mean, is what have we learned building outside of our comfort zone? I think that's a good place to start, so... Um, over the last, let's say, five weeks, we've talked about your your stacks list almost every day. And yeah. we're not going to talk about it anymore because last week we said we're done. Yeah, and we mean it. But we want to know what you learned building outside of Gruel Aggro. So now you're building, not even Gruel Aggro, Aggro. Now you're building a stacks list and we would we would lump stacks into the control umbrella. So you're building a control deck. How is that different 
in terms of your build process? What's the first control list I ever built? Like so I, true real control, not like mono blue steal all your stuff control. Because that's a list, but that's a that's a different thing, right? Yeah, the like actual control list. I've never done it before ever. So I mean, the first thing that obviously I did was I asked everybody in CCO Nation for help. You went onto Facebook and said, pictures only. <laughs> yeah. Please help me is the first thing that I did. And it worked out really, really well. And then from there it was just a matter of kind of piecing the pieces together i watched a few games uh, on youtube and in person of people playing controlly specifically stacks lists obviously to kind of figure out what everything was supposed to do and i kind of emulated those things given the suggestions that i had and the things i had in my binders and i mashed it all together into a deck and then i started playing it with you guys to try and figure out how it wins and the big thing that i learned is a i'm not I don't think I'm much of a control guy. I don't think it's in my nature per se. Uh, it's also tricky building the controlliest of control decks in stacks when I am, and we're going to get into this a little bit later on in the show, how all of my decks are built to play in our meta. Like I, I don't build them to be competitive at things like Vegas or the face-to-face -face event we went to down in Regina. I build everything to play with our friends, because I know the power level and I know where all the decks kind of fall into line. So everything I build, I build for that. And stacks, I can't do that because you either got to do it, you got to shit or get off the pot. Yeah. Just as an aside, I believe it was episode 71 that we talked about sort of your build process and how you were kind of segregating cards into one big pile to start making cuts. And we talked about control cards and then helping you find control cards were dredge cards that you were going to reanimate or regrow from your graveyard into your hand, using the graveyard as a second resource. That was kind of what we were talking about then. Now you've sounds like you've moved away from that. That almost sounded a little bit combo-y, how I just suggested it. And, and it totally was. When I, when I first put the deck together, it had all the dredge and all the recursion and all that stuff, and I found that it... Now I'm just playing a combo deck with a bunch of stuff that makes it really hard for me to play my combo. So I took all the combo crap you, out. You put your Hermit Druid in, and you put your Protean Hulk in, and then you put your all your reanimator effects in and all your dredge effects to get everything into your graveyard to reanimate the combo that you want to hit. Yeah, and yeah. that's not a stacks deck. Yeah, it's a combo deck. Turns out. So I nixed all that combo crap, and I put all the stacks crap back in, and... Uh, yeah, and I actually I won a game with it just yesterday, just last night. I did win a game with it via scoop, via uh, smokestack proper, right? Because you set it to four, and then you had like an Azusa and a Crucible of Worlds or something. I had. Uh, oh no, you had a Mitotic slime. I had a Mitotic slime and Marin with enough counters to bring back my Mitotic slime and a Phyrexian altar, so I could sack my Mitotic slime over and over and over again to get to get the four counters. And that's what I would sack to your to the four, smokestack. four counter smokestack. Yeah, and then I just erased everybody else's board, and they scooped. Cause... Yeah, I think everybody else was down to just one or two land when you were like, put a fourth counter on smokestacks, and everybody was like, "Okay, game's over." Yeah, <laughs> yeah. There's, there's no, there's no out of this. I'm he, Alex was playing black, so he was gonna have a hell of a time trying to resolve the three casting cost. Artifact killing spell that he had. <laughs> and uh, JJ just didn't draw anything, so peace. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, and I feel kind of bad about it. Like, I felt kind of bad. I was really proud of myself for winning with my new deck and something that was totally foreign to me. But at the same time, I, I felt kind of bad about it. Okay, well, um, let's 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 yeah. save that for a few minutes from now. Okay. Um, that, that'll fit nicely into our what is competitive to you kind of portion okay we talked a little bit about what you learned from building or how your build process changed we talked a little bit about how the deck plays uh, well at least in regards to smokestack <laughs> what about gameplay so you're you've you're, you're playing something that you've never air quotes never played before and difficult easy did you feel like you were using portions of the game that you haven't used before Agro uses the attack zone. Let's if that's a thing, right? It, the battlefield. And you're not battling when you're playing a control deck per se. You're 
waiting to react or if it's a more proactive type of destroy everything control deck like like a stacks deck can be did it feel different yes i like to put cards on the table and turn them sideways everybody knows that Mm -hmm. i talk about that lots and lots and in our meta especially where we don't there's not a whole ton of hard control out there to be an aggro player playing a hard control deck that's been built by a whole bunch of very intelligent magic minded people it it just it feels strange to shift from my regular game plan which is kill everyone to go to now i have to use these resources to make sure that nobody can kill me and it'll just work itself out and you told me that a bunch of times yes very much i was super frustrated with myself and you're just no brando you're looking at this wrong you gotta learn to just not lose. You remember, oh, you remember um, last week we talked about Stax Traxa. We talked about strength or weakness, however you look at it. Long game, long game, long game. And I think I said to you last night, uh, you were playing your thing. I was playing Mono Black Zombies. And Jesse was playing Oath of Tefri. Uh. Activate your Planeswalkers twice alongside a Venser. So he could bounce his two land every turn to tick him up. And then he ended up getting an emblem that says... Whenever you cast a spell, yeah, win the game. Whenever you cast a spell, exile target permanent. So he got one of these, and it was hard to fight through. And he was controlling you the way that you, uh, playing the stacks deck, should have been controlling him. Correct. And that was on the back of, like, a really lucky plane chase flip. So, I mean, it's neither here nor there how it happened, but that was the situation. And... I think what I said to you was, okay, that's what you have to beat because eventually that's going to kill you. So your plan needs to be now, how do I, you have to change your plan from, how do I not die from taking Kakusho damage triggers from Geoff? How do I kill Jesse's thing so he can't keep casting spells? And you ended up getting a Azusa and a Runumap Excavator and a Wasteland. Wasteland. So you could play three lands a turn, and you just dusted all of his lands except three, and it slowed him down two turns. And it's a good shift in strategy. I think that's the kind of thing that when you build outside of your comfort zone, you learn that, oh, I've got this whole other area worth exploring where before I would just try and kill Jesse. Now that's not an option because I don't have 40 power of goblins on the table. Yeah, I can't brand or remove him anymore, so I (laughs) I have to do it like other people do it. And it's a little bit of a tough pill to swallow, but because you're a budding control player, I'll just say it, maybe in the meta that you play in, maybe you have your deck built or tuned just a little bit incorrectly, right? And, and that's why you got to test it and practice it outside of just goldfishing it. It's very important that you, like we've talked about a little bit already, build your deck to fit the situations that it will probably find itself in. Yes, and the other thing that I want to say about that exact thing is everybody sits down. I whip out something sh- shitty, janky, like Lord of Tressorhorn. I-, I think it's, in my mind, it's my worst deck. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe my Brian Stout Arm is worse. But it's significantly worse. Brian, Brian Stout Arm, yeah. You think it's worse? Definitely. That deck actually plays good cards. Yeah, but it's a bad deck. Well, yeah. I'm sitting down with one of those two decks. You see that I'm playing Lord of Tressorhorn. What do you grab? I would grab something like Ajuan the Shifting Flame or a possibly Grimlock situation is where I'd probably find myself there. It's middle of the road, kind of just playing decks. Yeah. I'm not trying to combo you out. I'm not trying to kill the whole table in 10 turns. I'm not super worried that you're going to just end my life before I get to play in the game. Okay. What don't you grab when I grab Lord of Tressorhorn? Slivers. Stacks. There's the answer I was looking for. Okay, so I I sit down and I see that you have stacks. What do I grab? A faster combo deck, right? Because that's the only way that I can beat you. Because if you get a if you get a couple pieces online, you just lock me out and I can't do anything, right? So you have to build to the meta that you're sitting down against. And even if it's the same people, if there's a bunch of people in your meta that have multiple decks, like our group does. Yep. Whatever you thought you were going to play, throw that out the window because you're going to play everybody else's real decks when you play your real deck, right? And that's why I say maybe as a budding control player, you just misjudged what people were going to sit down with 
when you play your your now good deck. Yeah, I suppose. Could yeah. be a thing, right? Could be a thing. Last question kind of on this topic. Okay. Politically, in-game politics. Oh. What did you learn when you're playing something outside of your comfort zone? Don't tell anybody this. This is just this is just you and me and maybe you guys talking about this. I'm really good at table politics. I always brag to you I can counter spells with my face. <laughs> Because to- I totally have done that, even to you. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Even when you know I'm doing it. So I'm, I'm very good at those things. And you can't do it like that when you are the control player, or especially if you're a stacks player. None of my political game works because everything I do is awful. Yeah. And I know it's awful, so it's hard for me to defend that because it's like, oh, don't worry. It just makes you discard a card whenever you play a spell. It's not that... Uh, and, like, Jeff's coming over the table with a karate kick to try and kill me. Like, it's... The politicking changes entirely where it's hard to take the focus off of me and put it somewhere else, which is where I want it. The focus is always on you when you play a deck like this. Whatever it is. We can call it stacks. We can call it resource denial. Let's call it a control deck, right? This The focus is always on you because you're the one that is giving people permission or not. Allowing people to do their game plan or not, right? I Here's a political thing that I did, and I told him I did it. <laughs> uh, JJ kept a JJ hand. For those of you who haven't heard on the show yet what a JJ hand is, it's a one lander full of two drops. And, and then he just, eight drops. Yeah, <laughs> and he just doesn't draw another land. And he kept a hand with no land in it. But he had a brawn and a sol ring, so he figured I'm definitely going to draw land in two turns because based on his average of drawing land, that's definitely what's going to happen. And so he drew a card. It wasn't a land. He discarded his brawn. It came back around. He didn't draw land again. Discarded something else. And I'm playing stacks at the time, so you're just salivating. <laughs> I hit turn three, and in my hand is a trinisphere. Oh no! And it's like okay, I'll just turn JJ's game off right now. Is what I could have done, but I told him, you know. I could lock you out of the game right now, but I'm not going to, and I played something else. And then his next turn, he drew his land, and he played his Sol Ring, and he's back in the game. And then I played Trinisphere. <laughs> you gave him that one turn. Yeah, I gave him the one turn so he could at least pay three for something. And uh, But yeah, like it, I can do things like that where you let the thing through. And I know that's a bad play as a control player when you can just turn somebody's game off. You just do that. But that's the kind of thing I tried to do instead where you try not to interfere with somebody when they're not really messing with you but I don't know if that works and I'm not good at that kind of table politicking you know what you know what I the hard part about the table politicking when you're playing a resource denial deck I was going to say this before the JJ story but I'm happy you told it because I didn't know it <laughs> I did, yeah, well I wasn't there when that happened is you're denying my resources let's say you have a Tangle wire. Yeah. I have a Vandal Blast that I can't overload because I don't have the mana for it because of you. I'm going to cast it on you. There's probably a better artifact to trigger, but I have to get rid of that Tangle wire. Or I have to make it so you have less of an advantage. And let's say you have a counter spell. Or you don't have a counter spell. I have to make you take an action. Because every time I target you with something or do something, it's going to lessen your advantage right and that's why it's hard to politic because you either have to have it or you don't have it don't bullshit with me just have it or don't have it and i go vandal blast you go counter spell and i go fuck and then the next guy goes hmm vandal blast got it right you have it or you don't have it you got targeted with two vandal blasts and what are you gonna do you only had you only had it once yeah right so you went back to giving jj a chance yeah before you went to feeling a little bit bad or dirty that you're playing stacks. Yeah. Uh, I want to ask, what is competitive, right? Everybody assumes that CEDH, competitive EDH, is you sit down, everybody's playing like Baral Control <laughs> or Turn Shit. 2 Combo. Yeah. Right? That's, that's what everybody thinks. And you know why they think that? Maybe, I shouldn't say not everybody thinks that, but lots of people think that that's what competitive is, like that's what they think vintage is. And I think that people have that idea about CEDH because the C in CEDH stands for competitive. So because competitive is in the name, that's what competitive is. And it's not. Competitive isn't 
brawl control. It's not stacks. It's not turn two combo. It's not vintage 100 card singleton deck. It is competitive is a deck that you can play the hell out of and pull wins off with your play group, with the other decks that you actually play against. You're not net decking to take out the other CEDH decks. You are building a deck based on what you know about the people you're going to play with. And so you can use some of those spicy includes that we talk about on the show all the time to get an advantage over these other decks you know are coming. <laughs> you had mentioned somebody playing that three mana black destroy target artifact thing yeah. a couple minutes ago. Spicy include. I love it. Phyrexian tribute for Mirage. Black two sack two creatures as an additional cost. Destroy target artifact. Right? Now... Uh, brand new. I seen it in a game yesterday. Meteor Golem. Meteor Golem. Uh, comes into the battlefield. It's like a it's an artifact creature for seven, enters the battlefield, destroys target permanent. Oh. Yeah, and then there's the uh the um universal solvent one, mm. and then you pay seven, sacrifice it, right? These are the kinds of things that you can put in your mono black deck or your mono red deck to get rid of enchantments, right? Or in uh, in mono black enchantments or artifacts, right? Gate to Phyrexia, albeit that one's a little bit expensive now, but you can get there with it, right? The point is, I think that playing competitive or competitive EDH is building and tuning a deck, testing it, practicing with it like we all do, but actually playing the shit out of it. So we were talking with Evan the other day, friend of the show. F you, Evan. Lots of F you's this show. There will be several more. Good. Talking to Evan, because I'm playing Vivictus as Mahdi. That's my new deck to your uh, Numeran deck. So I'm playing it, and I'm destroying everything. I was wrecking house, and I felt bad. I felt bad because I showed up with a gun to a knife fight. Okay, fine. Maybe I just had a good curve and other... Whatever. I land my Liliana the Veil. No, my Liliana Vest, because I go to tutor pre, pre-combat, and... I'm tutoring, and Evan goes, oh, he's just going to put his it that betrays on top. He's going to attack, and then he's going to get the trigger. Then whenever we sack anything, he's going to get it. And that's what I was going to (laughs) do. But then he said it, and I thought, oh, well, no, I'll just, I'll get a whatever, right? And he said, well, why do you play bad? What, like, just win the game so we can play a different one. And I'm like, you can play that if you're testing it. We'll all just play better decks. And after the game, he said, there's no point in building an optimal list and then playing it to dump right yeah like build your deck to the power level that you want it to be at test it practice it tune it to fight the meta as you say and then play the shit out of it and then you are playing optimally you you are um, improving as a magic player and you're having probably more fun or if crushing your friends is fun to you you're probably having more fun because you don't have to dial back your play so your friends are having fun. Yeah. Right? Is that social contract? I know we said we're never going to talk about that on this show, but that's kind of what that is, right? Is make sure everybody's on the same page. I think that that's the one rule of the social contract, again, that that I think that everybody needs to be aware of. Like, if you're going to go into a new group, you don't just roll in with your best super tuned mega deck because either somebody's going to steal it because you don't know them or you're going to wipe them out and you're never going to get invited back you know what i mean like you have to kind of know what you're getting into you got to test the waters and i mean even if if all you have is cdh stuff then you you might run into an issue where you're just doing what you have fun doing and nobody else has any fun and so nobody wants to play with you nobody ever invites you back that group of players doesn't want to play with you anymore like yeah it's a thing, and I think that building lists like I do, I build lists that I find fun, that do all the things that I want them to do, but also do things that I want them to do in a way that I can still play them with my friends. And I have a couple of decks that I just, I can, but I don't play them. Like, I don't bust out Cranko very often. I don't bust out Slivers unless I'm in a really bad mood and I really need to impact a fucking game. Let's not call that slivers. Let's call it sliver queen combo. Yeah. There's a distinct difference there. Yes. Oh, yeah. That actually highlights my next talking point. I was talking with Evan again. Still F you, Evan. He emphasized of his Marchesa of the Black Rose deck. Is that the right? Did I call that the right thing? Yes, I play the other one. Marchesa one. I don't know. It's the one that if your guys die and they have counters, you get them back at the end of turn. He emphasized not 
building like a crazy combo list with that, taking infinite turns with time sieve and getting all your creatures back because they all have modular. He emphasized synergy over raw power. And I think you can make the same argument for consistency over raw power. And maybe a reoccurring theme in the arc of tier one tune downs is hey, I'm not I'm not playing, you know, Zer the Enchanter. I'm playing uh, Sea Monster Tribal Zer. There's and another tune down we did. Yeah, that was us. And you emphasize synergy when you build instead of raw power, and you advertise that when you're playing with your friends if it's new, or if you are being introduced to a new play group, you, in, you, you, you emphasize the synergy of the deck instead of the raw power. And if you play the shit out of a Sea Monster Zer deck to a win, that means you were playing the shit out of it. Yeah. Right? And that will both be very rewarding, but uh, highly respected amongst your peers, even if they're just randoms at your LGS. Yeah. One of the things that I picked up in Vegas, um, playing my Nor in the Wary deck, because it, it, my Nor in the Wary deck isn't very good. You can look at the list on our Tapped Out page, CCO Podcast on TappedOut.net. Is it up to date? Uh, not quite. There's a few more cards that have to change, but it's pretty much up to date. But it's not a very good list. It wins games because I'm really good at it. And I, I'll toot my own horn. That's a deck that I am very, very good at. And I think that people, when they sat down and played with me, even if it was kind of a miserable slog because I chaos them all out of the game, at least they respected me. They thought that it was fun. Like, they saw how much fun I was having, and it just kind of rubbed off. And I was like, oh, like, I like playing Magic with this person. And I think that at the end of the day, that's what you want your brews to show people like it's not i can build the strongest deck off of the internet read a primer and then play it you've built a deck that you find fun you've took you've taken the time to get good at it and understand all the inner workings and synergies in it and now you're going to bust it out and you're going to use a suboptimal weapon to take on something that's maybe more powerful in yeah. a, in, a, in a match outside your play group inside your play group nor in the wary is fine because he's built to play with us which I think stumbles accidentally into something that you wanted to talk about. We were talking about it on the way over here. In building decks that are kind of foot off the gas pedal a little bit or more focused on playing within a particular meta with a particular group of people, how do you avoid all of your decks just kind of becoming you know, face swaps of the same deck? Uh, the homogenization, right? You know that in your play group of 10 people, let's say five of them have... Five dudes have three artifact decks. How do you not put like Shatterstorm and Built to Smash and Vandal Blast in every single deck? Yeah, and that's that's hard sometimes because <laughs> I've done that. <laughs> you know what? I was actually just talking to another friend of the show, F-U-G off, and your stupid shoulder. Yeah. Ah, we shouldn't say that. He legit hurt his shoulder. Yeah, real bad. He was going like 50 on his bike on the street. And then he got cut off by another dude on a bike, and he flipped over his handlebars. And had he flipped over like two feet the other way, he probably would have died. So I'm glad he's not dead. Good on you for being tough, Geoff. Yeah, but, uh, sure. But yeah, next time break your shoulder like a real fucking hard ass, you pussy. I don't know what that means. <laughs> hey, when real men get hurt, they break something. See my elbow. Broken. His shoulder was in two pieces. There was no cast. I guess I'm not wearing a cast either. <laughs> or I'm not even wearing a sling this time. This is the second time I've had this exact same injury. Last time I wore a sling and like hobbled around and stuff. But this time I was like, ah, whatever. <laughs> you hurt your arm and then you ended up with a limp. <laughs> 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 Selling it to WWE style. Um, okay. Homogenization of lists. I'm talking to G off the other day. And going back to my worst list in my own reckoning, Lord of Tressorhorn. I still think it's Byron Stardom. So I could, I could add a Kakusho, what is he, the Evening Star? The Falling Star? I think Evening Star. I think Falling Star is the red one. Either, uh, either whatever. Way. Kakusho, that's everybody knows him, right? Or Kokusho, if you will. <laughs> when he dies, each player loses five life. You gain life equal to the life lost this way. Lord of Tressorhorn is a sacrifice deck. Everything in it isn't an enter the battlefield ability. It's a dies ability. Sounds like Kakusho would be awesome in it. So would Grey Merchant of Ashvidel. Right now, I know he's an enter the battlefield ability type dude, but I sacrifice him, then I can reanimate him over and over again. But that feels exactly like my Balthor the Defiled deck, one of my stronger decks, mono black combo. So to avoid 
all of my decks feeling the same or two of them feeling exactly the same. You you build outside of your comfort zone and you start making these weird includes in your Lord of Tressorhorn deck to make it feel very unique. And in doing that, you actually can start to play the game on a slightly different axis than your opponents think that you're going to play it on. And then it makes it harder to beat. I think that's going to be probably a reoccurring theme in the arc of Tier 1 Tune Downs is finding a unique strategy that is uncommon to this popular commander, popular strategy, let's say, and attacking your opponents like on a 45 degree angle instead of head on angle shooting yeah wait no Uh, that's a different thing no we don't want people doing (laughs) that that's how people died in the wild west (laughs) (laughs) in all honesty though like all these i don't know whatever whatever are we calling them tier one lists competitive lists Big reputation lists. Ah, ooh. Yeah. Big reputation lists all kind of feel the same. And I know we touched on it with the Xur Sea Monster Tribal. We're going to break that mold in arc of Tier 1 Toon Downs. In Toontown. What about player reputations, right? We we talk about that on the show and we throw out a hard FU sometimes when, when we talk about a certain way a player plays the game. Or... We, we did a whole show about it. Oh, yeah. What number was that? I don't remember. But we did do a whole show about like being that dirtbag at the table and you want to change your rep. That's what the plan is to do for these decks. We're going to try and change some reps. So it's funny. It takes What's the saying? It takes a lifetime to build a reputation, but it takes a minute to break a reputation. It's not how it goes, but that's I'm saying what it means. Yeah, it takes one ether flux fucking reservoir to ruin a reputation. <laughs> Alex, <laughs> thought you were a nice guy. Thought you were a good guy. It takes going back on one deal in Vegas Who against would go- Sean Tabar. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's two. That's two Sean shoutouts yeah. in a, in a row. I framed that bio visionary also. Oh, so excellent. Yeah, it's got it's hanging on the wall in my house. We got to throw down again. Hey, I want to go out to Toronto and beat those guys up. Like in a fight or at Magic. Because we could probably do both. You wait till I'm good to go, we'll go. Oh, Meet yeah. him in the middle of Young Street. We'll be walking down, flipping coins, kind of snapping our fingers like this. It'll be like on that movie that I can't remember the name of ever, but I reference it like every day. Everybody knows Everybody knows what we're talking about. We're like flipping coins and we have like old 1930s mobster suits on. Exactly. Yeah, with like pulled fedoras and we're walking in unison. Yep. And then it's all unicycles and stone cold stunners from there on out. It's going to be awesome. I'd do it. How about... Suplexes off the roof. That's kind of my thing. We can do that too. I ain't afraid. Suplex, I broke my arm. I'll do it again. I ain't chicken. <laughs> yeah, you obviously you've broken your arm twice now. <laughs> yeah, I'm not afraid. <laughs> oh, I sold Jesse the farm one time. I just thought of the So, three players left in the game. It was a big game. It was like a six player game because we're stupid and we do that. <laughs> yeah, we Jesse's do. to my left. To his left is Smitty. I can nuke Smitty's board. Jesse has me dead on board. Jesse says he can deal with Smitty. I think I can deal with Smitty if I kill Jesse. Jesse was lying to you. Just Speaking of player reputation, Jesse was lying to you. But let's continue the story. But the, the story is that I'm the liar. Of course you're the liar. Just ask Sean Tavares. <laughs> <laughs> so I tell Jesse, don't kill me. I can't kill you. Specifically, <laughs> I can't kill you. So he messes with Smitty. Come back to my turn. I nuke his board, but I don't kill him. <laughs> I say go. He can't do anything. He's like, land, go. Smitty kills him. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, yes, now I have to deal with Smitty. I use my artifact removal on Jesse's shit. Smitty goes, platinum angel, like a noob. And I go, what? Who re- plays that card? I remember this game. And it was, was like an extra hour of me just misery dying to Smitty like, He's dinking me four points a turn with this Platinum Angel. I was at like 50 because he can't do anything else. And eventually he he critical massed enough Planeswalkers to sweep my thing and kill me and blah, blah, blah. And I made Jesse wait the whole time. You because, made everybody wait the whole yeah, time. I was, was there too, you jerk. So when you talk about reputation, I spent all this time always doing what I'm going to say, always doing what I'm going to or saying what I'm going to do and doing what I said I was going to do, right, in game, backing up threats, backing up threats. That's what we talked about in our reputation Yep. Reputation management. That sounds like a training course I took. Ugh. <laughs> Anyways, 
I'm managing my reputation the best I can. Then I sell out in Vegas to the whole world. Commander's Brew talks about it. We talk about it. I'm, I'm screwed now. And then, like, the week after, none of our play group that was not in Vegas knew that story yet because they didn't listen to the podcast. And I just sold Jesse the farm. And it's like, now I have this terrible reputation. So I guess if you're going to develop that bad reputation, it's important to back it up. You have to embrace it and just go with it. Like, I've gone with it. And no, you, nobody ever bats an eye when I lie to them. And I lie to people all the time. <laughs> I have no cards in my hand. Like, I got tricks. You ain't got no tricks. You don't even have a hand. Uh Uh-huh. And I have a reputation where once I do that little point that I did that nobody could see, there's tricks. Tricks. There might be tricks. There's like 70% that I might have tricks. The trick might be me taking your deck and throwing it on the floor and then like- We don't condone this. Rearranging all of the stuff on your board while you're picking up your cards, but there's tricks. That's not a thing. Yeah, that that never actually happened. (laughs) The point is, if you've got a reputation- to, to do whatever, make sure that you can back that up. Like, don't have a reputation just because you want to change what your reputation is. If you have that reputation because you build decks a certain way or that you always play a certain strategy or you always sell people out or you always have spot removal at instant speed and you leave mana open. Jesse. Have it, right? And build on that reputation, Right. And that's, I, I guess that's why those decks, like all these tier one lists that we're going to be looking at over the next month, that's why they have that reputation that they do because they can do that. They They're always super redundant. have it, right? They, yeah. yeah, super redundant. I actually just remembered something when, I, when, when we got off talking about that. I haven't ever whacked somebody's deck off of the table, but I have put my hand in my lap, like my hand of cards in my lap and forgot it was there and somebody attacked me because they thought I didn't have any cards in my hand and I just like reached down and pulled them out. <laughs> I forget who that was, but that was awesome. You are actually the worst Cause, magic player. Because I totally did have tricks in my hand that they didn't <laughs> think I had. Nobody asked. Nobody asked me if I had a hand. We also don't condone that. No, I don't. Con- no, I do. I'll. You ask me if I have a hand, I'll tell you. But just mm. because you don't see me with cards doesn't mean I don't have any. You know what? You know what I do, actually? like This is a trick that little old nephew Joel used one time on Evan. Uh, right when he was brand new to our play group. Uh, Joel's playing one of my decks. It's got Obnixilis, The Fallen. Was that the first one, the Landfall one? Sure. Landfall Obnix. Whatever it's got Landfall Obnix. So you Landfall and he gets... He gets big and he and hits he somebody. Hit, drains somebody. Somebody something. loses three and he gets like three plus one plus one counters. He's a three, three for six or whatever. So Joel plays him, pass the turn, comes back around to Joel... He's looking over at Evan, who's got like two, three, four blockers. He goes to Evan, any flyers? Evan goes, no. Joel goes, play a land, dink you for three, put three counters on my Obnix, swing for six. Evan's just like, ugh, I guess I have to take it. And he doesn't even fly. Yeah. (laughs) That's, it was so awesome. And nobody said anything. I don't think anybody else actually noticed because Joel was just so nonchalant about it. But uh, it was like, Two turns again, or it was Joel's turn again. Like, it was a long time after this. Evan picked the card up and said, this doesn't even fly. And everybody <laughs> just at the same time was like, oh, lost their <laughs> shit, right? So I do condone that. That's good stuff. <laughs> and kind of going from reputation back into the deck building thing, which is what we were talking about, Joel has a reputation of being an excellent magic player in his brain. He can take virtually any deck and <laughs> yeah, make it Yeah, to work. him, he's good. Ah, <laughs> subtle, subtle yeah. dig on Joel. Yeah, a <laughs> few Joel. And Evan is the value guy. Like, he he builds all of his decks with that, that grindy consistency. Not all, all of his decks are the same, but they all kind of have that consistent value to it. You're, you and Geoff are both combo guys. They're not blazing fast turn two, kill everybody on turn two combos, but usually they're combo decks. Mm-hmm. I mean, it. I'm an aggro guy. I play, like, I turn cards sideways all the time. That doesn't make all my decks the same. They don't all win by overrunning you with goblins. And they're all kind of on that axis where they're pretty equal. Uh, Jesse's the spot removal control creature sweeper value creature because he has all of them kind of guy. A lot of his decks, to me, feel the same. And that might just be a dig at Jesse because control, to me, I don't have that in my head. So it's all the same to me. They're all equal and they're all the same. And we all kind of have that 
we they're have all the good... same in power level and consistency. Yeah, I think is important. They're not. They don't all do the same thing. Yeah, they they have the same goal, but they get to that goal in a different way. You're not always just running straight down the road. Sometimes you got to cut through the building or drive around through the gas station. I forget what. <laughs> what the hell? I, there's a word for that. I forget what it is when you try when you drive around a red light by going through the gas station. Oh, I wonder what that word is. I don't CCO con- Nation's got to let us know. Yeah, and if you have a funny name that could go for that, just ship it off to us. CCO Brando, CCO Podcast on Twitter. Send us, uh, if you have anything funny that you call those people. <laughs> yeah. But I think that kind of brings us sort of to the end of what we wanted to talk about today. So we should probably go over our new giveaway one more time. Ooh, yeah, very much so. And uh, we'll set up the new arc a little bit more for you just to let you know what we're going to be doing next week. And then we will, I guess, sign off for the week? Yeah, probably going to go watch a baseball game. Probably going to drink some beer. Yeah. There was one other thing that I had to do. Oh, I was going to, like, fall seed my grass now that it's cut and harrowed. Now it's dark. It's pretty dang dark, yeah. (laughs) Uh, Well, I guess I'll just drink beer and watch ball. We're in Canada. It's 7 o'clock. It's dark now. Oh, yeah. You know what else is we're in that weird kind of twilight era of the baseball season where CFL football, NFL football, and baseball are all on TV at the same time. It's a lot of sports. Yeah, and when the stars align, all of my teams win at the same time. It happened last week. Wow. Yeah, on the same day. Oh, my. Yeah, I, well, the same Sunday's NFL, Saturday's CFL, and then, like, every single goddamn day is baseball. Yeah, like, I have fake, I have fake favorite sports teams. As we talked about before, NFL is the Lions, yep. CFL is the Stampeders. They're actually my favorite team for reasons we can talk about later. You get the hell out of my house. I don't have to be a Ryder fan just because you are. I bleed red like a regular person. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> and I I don't think I have a favorite baseball team anymore. It used to be the White Sox because I don't know why, but I'm in the market for a new favorite baseball team. Turns out I don't want to cheer for the Jays just because I'm Canadian. I feel like that's a that's pigeonholing myself. I don't want to do that. How about you cheer for the pigeons? That's not a thing. Are the no, they're not. Wait, maybe that's what. The, did the guy that killed that pigeon with the ball? He played for the Sox, didn't he? Or he I have Yankee? no idea. That's like my favorite baseball. Clip. <laughs> that one and that one from last week where the guy gets just drilled in the head by the ball. You see what? It? Buddy's running for home and the ball oh, just yeah, comes yeah, over. Yeah, just, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. That was awesome. Yeah, the uh, the guy tried to get an outfield assist at home and hucked the ball from left field, and he was just a little bit off, and it hit the runner in the back. That's why you wear helmets, kids. Yep. Why do I have to wear a batting helmet? That is exactly why. No, because that guy's still alive and making millions of dollars. You like Geoff, except not making millions. He yeah. wiped out on his bike, still alive. I like that. Yeah. Yeah, being alive is excellent. Giveaway. Giveaway. MTGOnslaught.com. Wait, that's not right. MTGOnslaught.com. I don't know how I was going to say it, but (laughs) mtgonslaught.com has been generous enough to help your boys Ryan and Brando out with a giveaway, gaming supplies, and or apparel. I would like to send to you free of charge stuff from mtgonslaught.com, and you're going to have to listen to the arc of Tier 1 Tune Downs in Toontown. To find out how to win, we have got metal dice, we've got life counters, plus one and minus one tokens, we have got t-shirts, stickers, they make everything. Go to mtgonslot.com, peep their stuff, link will be in the show notes. Sometimes we help you pimp out your cards, sometimes we help you pimp out your strategy, but with these game mixes you're going to be able to pimp out like yourself without wearing a stupid fuzzy hat. Yeah. You're going to have the sweetest life counters, you're going to have the sweetest tokeny stuff, you're going to have all that cool stuff. Yeah, pimp out your, pimp your life. Yeah. Hey, bro, I heard you like pimp. Well, I got you some pimp for your pimp, so you can pimp while you pimp. Wow, 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 That's some pimp music. Final thoughts of the day. Final thoughts of the day. We were a little bit tangential today, but what we were really trying to get across was that competitive doesn't always mean high-powered and, like, super blow up everybody all the time. Competitive just means... You can go in with a deck and you can play it and you can put up a fight in the meta that you're playing in. You can take a deck that you're really skilled with and you can take it outside your regular playgroup and you can beat those stupid combo lists. You can build a deck that with some skill and luck, you can 
pilot it to victories that you either have no business attaining or are just so well balanced in your games that all the games are interesting, which is at the end of the day, what you want your games to be. Turn 2 Prosh Food Chain isn't interesting after you've seen it once. It's kind of a downer because it takes you longer to shuffle your deck than it does to play a game. One interruption. I would argue that Turn 2 Prosh Food Chain is only interesting to read about. Even if it happens to you one time, it's not interesting because you've already read about it and you were like, well, that's cool. Moving on. <laughs> yes. But that's what we're aiming to do in this next arc is we're going to take those super powerful things like a Prosh food chain and we're going to take that deck and we're going to size it down to, say, a medium competitive meta and have the deck still be powerful but still be really cool and kind of take it out of that pigeonhole that, oh, you're playing Prosh combo, you piece of shit. And we're going to show you all how to do that on the next episode of Commander Cookout Podcast. Hit our theme song! Woo!